afternoon. Can I help you? Yes, you can. Thank you. I've got an ad here for the job wanted column. Am I in time for tonight's paper? Uh-huh. Steve Mallory. Why, of, of course, you're Captain Steve Mallory, the war hero. Oh, Captain, I... I can't tell you what this means to me. Uh, meeting you face to face. Well, I didn't know I had a fan club. Oh, it's not a fan club. It's just one person that's had a crush on you since 1943. Oh, collecting clippings about you, cluttering up the house with pictures of you, and... Oh, it, it's quite a crush. Well, I uh, wish I'd known about it. You should have written me a letter or something. Oh, he did. He did? But Teddy, my uh, kid brother. <laughs> you know how kids are. You're the biggest thing in his life. Uh, since Buck Rogers. Oh, I see. You mean it was uh, your kid brother that had this... Uh, this well, uh... Uh, of course, Captain. Whom did you think I meant? Oh, well, I, I did think maybe it was... Uh... Well, anyway, you can tell your kid brother for me that Captain Mallory is now yesterday's news. That's today's news. Steve Mallory needs a job. Well, brace yourself, Captain, because this is going to be a jolting surprise to you. We're so efficient around here that we can answer your ad, even before it appears in the paper. It's as easy as that. Hey, it's even addressed to me. Where'd you get this? A man brought it in about an hour ago. It seems our last night's edition ran a picture of you with a story about you being in the city and looking for a job. Well, this is the fastest job I ever got in my life. Except the one that I got from my draft board. Well, here, sir, is your ad. Uh, and here, sir, is your ad. Oh, uh, thanks. <laughs> Answered without ever being printed. I hope you appreciate the fact that I saved you the sum of 65 cents. I'd like to show you how much I... Uh, Miss Lane, will you have dinner with me tonight? Sorry, but my mother doesn't like me to have dinner with strangers. Oh, but I'm not a stranger. You just said yourself that uh, the name Steve Mallory is a household word. My kid brother's household word. Now look, Miss Lane, hey, you ought to be ashamed of yourself. Can you go home tonight and tell that child that you had a chance to have dinner with a great Steve Mallory and turned it down? Well, since you put it that way, I'll go. Great. And we'll take Teddy with us. And you can tell him all about how you shot down those planes. <laughs> How's that for an idea? <laughs> yeah, that's a great idea. There I was, 20,000 feet high over enemy territory. My right motor was on fire. The zeros had me outnumbered 10 to 1. I thought you said it was your left motor. All right, so it was my left motor. Now, don't interrupt him, Teddy. That's him, all right. Who's the dame and the kid? I don't know. Well, here it is, 248. Good luck, Steve. Wait a minute, Captain. You didn't tell me the rest of that story. Uh, all right, uh, let me see. Uh, where was it? Oh, yes, uh, I bailed out. There I was, coming down on my parachute. The sky was full of zeros. They were diving at me, cutting loose from the machine guns. They were trying to shoot me while I was hanging in the ropes, 10,000 feet in the air. I thought you said 20,000. So I came down 10,000 feet. Do you want to know what happened? They killed you. Nah. We'll be in the lunchroom. I shouldn't be long. I bet the guy's been giving you the two time. I don't know. But I'll tell you one thing. I'm going to tell that dame and find out. Well, Mr. Redfern, I'm glad to see you up and about again. Feeling better, Mr. Redfern? Oh, uh, yeah. Fine, thanks. Come in. Oh, I guess I must be in the wrong room. I uh, saw an ad in the paper. I'm looking for a friend of mine called Joe. I'm Joe. At any rate, I'm the Joe that put the ad in the paper. Only his name ain't Joe, it's Paul. Inspector Paul Crean, United States Secret Service. This is Lieutenant O'Hara, City Police. I don't get it. You will in a minute. 
I want to introduce you to uh, Mr. Dan Redford. Redford? That's what the lady in the hall just called me. I'll show you why. Officer, throw your light on him. Holy smoke. Looks enough like you to be your twin brother, doesn't he? Ever see that face before? Every day. In the mirror when I shave. What's the matter with him? The doctor said it was poison. Tried to kill himself when we came to arrest him. He didn't want to go back to San Quentin again. Again? Dan Redfern just spent nine years in prison for forgery. He got out two weeks ago. We've been tailing him because we wanted these. Those are plates for printing counterfeit $10 bills, and they're probably the most perfect plates I've seen in the 10 years I've been in the Secret Service. A lot of work went into making those plates. Redfern worked on them the whole time he was in prison, every secret moment he could spare. Then his cellmate tipped us off the day he got out. Sit down. How do I fit into all this? I saw your picture in the paper last night. You look so much like Dan Redfern, it gave me an idea. The paper also said you were looking for a job, so I addressed an ad to you, signed it Joe. Here you are. Mallory, how would you like to work for Uncle Sam? I've been working for him for the last six years. Strictly an undercover job, probably risky. <laughs> My last job for Uncle Sam, that was risky too. Steve, I want you to pose as Dan Redfern. Mind if I ask why? Because when Redfern made those plates, he never intended to use them himself. Printing bogus money and shoving it after it's printed, that's a job for an organization. Besides, Redfern, just out of prison, knew he'd be watched pretty closely. So he offered the plates for sale through Underworld channels. And a man in the East, uh, an Otto Dagoff, was the highest bidder. In fact, he bid $30,000 for them. Redfern was going to New York tomorrow night to sell the plates to Dagoff. I have his ticket right here. You mean I pose as Redfern? I uh, go to New York with this ticket and sell these plates to a man you call uh, Otto Dagoff? Why? Because as soon as Dagoff gets those plates, he'll start printing up bills by the thousands and peddling them to his underlings for shoving. We want his whole underworld machinery to get into motion. Then in one swoop, we pull in the entire ring. How about it, Mallory? You think my face will fool Dagoff? Remember, Redfern's been in prison for nine years. Nobody on the outside has seen him, not even his wife. He's got a wife? Don't let that worry you. He heard there was another man. He didn't get in touch with her when he got out. Here's 500 advance for expense money, and you take the train tomorrow night. And remember, Mallory, you're strictly on your own. You risk your life if they catch you trying to get in touch with any government office. Can I even get in touch with you? Nor any branch of the Secret Service. You leave it all to us. One of my men will contact you after you deliver the plates to Dago. How do I find him? Oh, he'll contact you when your train arrives in New York. In the meantime, we'd better hold uh, Redfern here incommunicado. Because if we book him in jail, it might leak out. And you'd be a clay pigeon for every gun in the ring. Steve, I can't afford any slip-ups. Neither can I. So long, Redfern. Good luck. So long. ice cream and candy by school kids. What do you have? Oh, some coffee, I guess.
What kind of a job is it? I'm taking tomorrow night's train, the Overland Limited. I have to see a man in New York. Will you work in New York? Maybe, but not for long. Where'd you get this? The lady told me to give it to you. The lady just went out. Be right back. Outside. After all, the poor guy's been in stir nine years. I'll be right out here. Just call. What's the matter? Matter? Nothing's the matter. Why? You don't seem very glad to see me. Is it that dame? What dame? The one last night with the kid. Who is she? Look, I'd rather not talk about it. Okay. I, uh... Hear that you've got another guy. You mean Witzel? Are you kidding? We were only working together. Cops got wise and Benny and I had to lay low. But not Witzel. They didn't have him tagged. So we had to keep away from him. You believe me? Maybe. Well, it's the truth, honey. Benny and I figured you'd be watched by a parole officer when you got out. I was even afraid to write you. They might trace the letter. I got yours, though. That's great news. How much are they paying you for it? How do you mean? The plates. Haven't you got the plates? Oh, yeah. How much is Degas paying? Uh, 30 Gs. Only 30? Well, even Witzel could pay 20. With Degas' connections, he could make a couple of million. And he wants to pay you 30. Well, uh, still a lot of dough. When you've been in jail for nine years. You changed, Dan. Oh? Huh? How do you mean? Hmm? I don't know. Well, uh, nine years is a lot of time. Your hair. You took the white streak out. Yeah. I uh, had a diet. Uh, they could spot me a mile off. I'll get my luggage and move in with you. Oh, uh, maybe you better not. Why not? We're married, aren't we? We can show the port our wedding rings. But well, where's yours? Uh, it's at the jewelers. Uh, they had to change the size. What's the matter? Nothing. I'll send Benny for the porter. Come in, Benny. Uh, honeymoon over already? Shut the door. What's up? I want to show Dan. Sit down. I said sit down. Lock the door, Benny. What's the matter? This guy's not Dan. Take a look at his hair. I told you I had it dyed. Did you grow a new thumb on your left hand? Let me see that hand. That San Quentin's a great place. You lose a thumb in the machine shop and they sew it back on for you. Go to work, Benny. He's got Dan's place. you ring for me, sir? Yeah. You make any stop the last 20 minutes? Yes, sir. Sacramento, 10 minutes ago. You notice a man and woman get off? Blonde and a fellow in a blue striped suit? Well, you must mean the couple from car eight. They was routed through to New York, but they got off at Sacramento. I understand the lady lost something. Yeah? yeah so did I. How soon can I get off this train? Well, we make a stop at uh, Roseville at 10.58. That's where we take on an extra locomotive to push us up over the mountains. Yeah, we're going to climb those mountains without me. I got a date back in San Francisco. Your head's hurt. What happens, sir? Fell out of bed. It's all right.
Okay, okay, that's enough pictures. Look, it's Mr. Redford. Come here, you. Well, it's him, all right. I mean, it's the man I saw in the hall the night before last. I thought he was Mr. Redford. What's your name? Mallory, Steve Mallory. What happened to him? He's dead. Poison? Knifed. Knifed five times in the chest. But we did find a bottle of poison here. How did you know about it? The night before last, I was here and he was lying. So you killed him, huh? Would I have come back here if I had? You might. You admit being here the night before last, huh? What time? Oh, it was about, uh... It was just after 8, officer, I know, because I met him coming down the hall and I thought he was Redfern, and I was just coming down from changing C8. I remember the time... Yeah, he yeah. Was... So you were here about the time Redfern was knocked off? When I left, he was still alive. You got witnesses to that, huh? The best you could want. Two city police officers, a detective named Nahara, and Inspector Paul Crean of the United States Secret Service. Frisco. Apparently, you don't believe me. Oh, sure, sure. You toss a few names around and we drop the whole matter. Sure, sure. Does this mean I don't see Inspector Crean? You can send him your address and your cell number. If he can't get by, he can send flowers. Phone the car on the Sam and get this place cleaned up. Yes? Lieutenant Thorndike's here. He's got Mallory. Send them in, please. Sit down, gentlemen. So, you're Steve Mallory. Thorndike phoned me the story you told down at the jail. Very interesting. Very. Look, if I'm going to have to tell that story again, I want to tell it directly to Inspector Crean. Why can't I see him? Inspector Crean's the man who hired him to go east, posing as Redford. He said he met Inspector Crean at that apartment house the other night. I did meet Inspector Crean at that apartment. And it's true. He hired me for a Secret Service job. Yes, Mr. Mallory, your story is very interesting. Very. There's just one thing wrong with that story, Mr. Mallory. I happen to be Inspector Crean. And I did not meet you at an apartment house on Belmont Street. Of course not. Man didn't look anything like you. Now he's going to tell us that there are two Inspector Creeds. I can still prove my story. There were three other men in the apartment that night. Two city police officers and a detective named O'Hara. All you have to do is canvas your own police department and verify it. All right, Simpson. We found these in the closet of apartment B-5. Two police uniforms, rented from the Golden Gate Costume Supply Company. Well, that does it. I don't suppose you'll ever believe my story now. On the contrary, Mallory, I do believe it. You mean that? Well, look, a man can think of some pretty fancy alibis when he's facing a murder rap. But nobody could think of an alibi that fantastic. Besides that, I checked Mallory's records. He's okay. Well, thanks. But who's the man that hired me the other night? to take those plates to somebody named Otto Dakoff. I don't know, but I do know this. There is such a person as Otto Dagoff. And we have reason to believe that he's behind certain foreign subversive activities in this country. That he's their chief source of income, which is secured from flooding the country with counterfeit money. So Dagoff very well might be willing to pay $30,000 for those counterfeiting plates. That's another reason that I believe Mallory's story. So you can release him into my custody. From now on, I'll be responsible for it. I'll have to get an okay on that. You will, Lieutenant. The local police are usually quick to release a United States Secret Service man when they arrest him by mistake. You mean he is one of your boys? I mean, he can be if he wants the job. Look, Mallory, whoever posed as me the other night was working for my office at the time, only he didn't know it. Why, he handed me an idea on a silver platter. Will you accept a special appointment to the Secret Service? For a guy who was out of work last week, I'm sure getting a lot of offers. The department, Mallory, has two objectives in this case. Get those counterfeiting plates out of circulation and trap Otto Dagoff. Now, one way to accomplish it is this. I'd like to trick Dagoff into believing that Dan Redfern is still alive, still has those plates. Now, that's where you come in. 
Instead of chasing Dagoff and Laura all over the country, I think I can bring them both out here into a trap. We'll tip off Dagoff that something went wrong, that if he wants those plates, he'd better hop the next plane to San Francisco. He'll come all right, and before, I hope, Laura has a chance to contact him in New York. Now you, posing as Dan Redfern, will be waiting for Dagoff at the apartment. And that's the point where we move it. How about it, Steve? Is it a job? Well, looks like I'm sticking my neck out again. But uh, it's a job. Keep all this under your hat, Lieutenant. I'm sorry to rob you of your number one murder suspect. All in the day's work, I guess. So long. We've got to work fast. The first step is to get in touch with Dagoff. Yeah, how? Well, I realized that Redford must have communicated with Dagoff when he made the deal for the plate. So I got in touch with the prison this morning. I find that just before his release, Redford tipped a prison guard to put this ad in the New York papers, placing it locally. The ad seems innocent enough. The guard had no reason to be suspicious. But they do keep a careful record of these things. Mallory, you're supposed to be in New York. I uh, decided I might not like the climate. All of a sudden, it came to me, like a blow on the head. You quit your job? Somebody beat me out of it, but I got another one, just like that. Will you stay in town this time? Mm-hmm, for the rest of my life. And I uh, hope it's a long one. Uh, I, uh, I got some business for you. Yeah, it's another ad for the personal column. Oh, you're too late for this edition. The classifiers just went to press. Well, it's not for your paper. It's for all your affiliated papers in the state of New York. New York? Uh-huh. Uh, can't you wire it in in time for the uh, New York morning editions? Well, certainly, but it's a funny request. You never heard of it before? Well, yes, a couple of weeks ago, there was one sent over from San Quentin Prison. Don't give it another thought on it. I'm not the jailbird that sent it. Uncle Otto, something came up that I have to stay here at 248 Belmont Street, apartment B5. Take the next plane, bring money for picture. Your nephew, the other one was signed down R2. Don't worry your pretty little head about it, Susie. I'll tell you all about it one of these days. In the meantime, this is just between the two of us. Steve, you're not in any trouble, are you? A little. But it's a better job than the one I had yesterday. This time, I'm working for nicer people. How much do I owe you? be in the second section. Good morning. A lovely morning, isn't it? New York is always very pleasant this time of the year. You close the door, Herman, will you? Thanks. Aren't you in the wrong compartment? No, I think not. I'll introduce myself in a moment. Uh, do you mind if I sit down? Uh, thank you. Man of my age usually talks better, even thinks better from a sitting position. Ah, that's better, much better. Now, let me see, where were we? You were going to introduce yourself. Ah, yes, yes, yes. Uh, Dan Redfern. I know your husband quite well, Mrs. Redfern. You seem to know me, too. Your name is Laura Daring before you married Redfern. And this is your brother, Benny. This guy must be a fortune teller. <laughs> Let me read the tea leaves for you. You got off the train when it stopped at 125th Street to pick up all these New York papers. Shall I tell you why you wanted those papers? You put a message in the personal columns. You wired it from Chicago, and you wanted to check to see if it was in. And maybe I can find the message for you. Allow me. Uh, Oh, yes. Here it is. May I read it to you? Uncle Otto, arrive Grand Central Station, 9 a.m. Bring money for Dan's picture. And it's signed Dan's wife. Okay, okay. Introduce yourself. I? Oh, naturally, I am Uncle Otto. Why, just say so in the first place. 
We expected to meet you at Grand Central. My dear young lady, in my business, it's often well not to be where one is expected. You got the dough? If you mean, have I the money for the plates that Dan Redford made while he was in prison? I have. However, there seems to be some complication. What are you getting at? There's another message in the same paper, in the same column. Let me read you this one. Uncle Otto, something came up and I have to stay here at 248 Belmont Street, apartment B5. Take next plane, bring money for picture. And this is signed your nephew, Dan R. Let me see that. It's all very confusing. One message says that Dan Redfern still has the plates way out in San Francisco, while your message... No, we haven't. Show them to him. You take me for a fool. What do you mean? Must I explain the obvious? These are not Dan Redfern's plates. Do I have to tell you that you had imitations made in order to cheat me out of $30,000? Do I have to spend my time listening to a petty thief? Listen, you. Nobody talks to me like that. Nobody. Sit down. Squirt. Sit down, Benny. Making trouble won't buy us a thing. Look, if that's a phony set, we don't know anything about it. Don't you see what happened? Guy in the train. He looks like Dan enough to fool Mr. Dagoff. So he phonies up the set, plans on beating Dan East with it and closing the deal. Well, there's no harm done. Apparently, Dan Redfern still has the place in San Francisco. Now, Harlan, our plane leaves LaGuardia Field at noon. Wait a minute. How can I be sure those plates are phony? Now that you got them in your pocket, I'm not so sure. <laughs> Perhaps this will convince you. I'm delighted to have met you both, I'm sure. I'm on the door, please. Look, Mr. Dagoff, you're still going to pay Dan 30000 for that set. I'd like to fly out to California with you. And do you mind if I ask why, young lady? Because I believe half a man's income belongs to his wife. And I happen to be the man's wife. <laughs> of course. And come along by all means. I'm sure that you and your brother will make charming traveling companions. Let's be on our way, Herman. Yes? Steve Mallory on the phone. Hello, Steve. I'm glad you called. One of my men just came from the airport and tells me that Otto Dagoff arrived from New York tonight. He got off the plane in a party of four. One of the members of the party was a young woman, a blonde. That could be Laura Redfern. But if it is, that means she contacted him in New York. She would have sold him the plates there. Why would they bother to come back out here? Yeah, so it's probably not Laura Redfern. Anyhow, we'll have to gamble that it isn't. We'll go ahead as we planned, Steve, and good luck. Thanks. Maybe I'm going to need it. I even got back to Sacramento. That's why I came back. You uh, told me not to get in touch with you, so I just went back to that apartment and waited. Uncle Otto, something came up and I have to stay here at 248 Belmont Street, apartment B5. Take next plane, bring money for clear. It's signed your nephew, Dan R. Secret Service office in Washington advised me this appeared in all the New York papers this morning. Do you know anything about it? Yeah, I wrote it myself. I wired it to New York. Why? 
Well, I thought it would lure Otodega up out here before uh, the Redfern woman could get in touch with him and uh, sell him the plates. I figured it first off, see. I thought it'd give us time to uh, find Laura and uh, get the plates back from her. You're a good man, Mallory. <laughs> we need more men like you in the Secret Service. Another message like this appeared in the New York papers this morning. It was from Laura Redburn to Dagoff. It said she was bringing him the plates. Oh, I see what you mean. Uh, my gag didn't work. Dagoff won't come out here now, huh? On the contrary, he may come out here. There's even a chance he will come out here. Don't ask me why. <laughs> Don't ask him why. Drive us back, O'Hara, and we'll drop off, Mr. Murray. You mean my job's finished? Your biggest job is yet to come, Mr. Mallory. With this gun? The law wants Otto Dagoff, Mallory. The law wants him dead or alive. You think he might be dead? Otto Dagoff is a dangerous man. The service expects you to do your duty. Remember, dead or alive. I don't trust that guy. If you ask me, he'll still get the plates himself. He's holding out on us. Figures to make his own deal with Dago. You're wrong, Al. If he was going to make his own deal, he'd have gone on to New York and made it there. No. Laura Redfern snatched the plates, all right. I still don't trust that guy, Mallory. He's up to something. Sure he is. That personal he put in the New York papers to Dago. How come Steve Mallory knows the way to get in touch with Dagoff? We didn't tell him. Who did? Sure, that's what I mean. He's up to a double cross. Let him run around loose. He won't be on the loose for long, Al. Not when he runs up against Otto Dagoff. You gave Mallory a gun, didn't you? Yeah. I gave him a gun. A gun you couldn't kill a fly with gun with a firing pin filed down. not Dan. It's a guy I told you about on the train. He's a ringer. Take a look at his hand. Look at the nice shiny pistol. I bet he stays up till nine o'clock every evening just to polish it. Won't you be seated, young man? Oh, man, sit, sit down. Is this the set of plates you were bringing to New York to? Sell to me for $30,000. If you got them from her, then they're the plates. She's the one that took them away from me, with the help of her brother. Young man, Dan Redfern spent nine years in prison, every spare secret moment of which he devoted to making a perfect set of plates for the counterfeiting of $10 bills. I want that set of plates. I'm willing to pay a handsome price for it. <laughs> you know, and I know those are not Dan Redfern's plates. They're not even a good imitation. You mean they're the wrong ones? Do I have to tell you that? I don't get it. Who are you kidding? You want us to get tough? Where's Redfern and Witzel? Ah, oh, Mr. Daring has a very good question. I'll repeat it. Where is Mr. Witzel? Uh, who's Witzel? Listen, bright boy, don't try to dummy up on us. My sister and me were parked outside here the night before you took the train. We seen you come in here. That night you had a dame and a kid with you. We seen you come in, we seen Henry Witzel and some other guys come in. I don't know anybody called Henry Witzel. Unless it was that tall fella, the one that gave me the job. Job? No, what job? To pose as Redfern because I look like him. And to do what? Take these plates to New York and sell them to you for 30 grand. See? 
What did I tell you? Witzel offered Redfern 20 grand for the plates, and you bid 30. Witzel couldn't match your bid, so he, he just snatches them. As a side racket, he makes up a phony set and hires this guy to peddle them to you as the original. Listen, this was all news to me. I was hired to pose as Redfern. I didn't know there were two sets of counterfeit plates. Young man, I have a great dislike for people who try to double-cross me. If you have any regard for your health, your future, I'd suggest that you cooperate with me. What he means is, he wants Redfern's original plates. Talk fast, Squirt, where are they? Oh, that fellow you call uh, Henry Witzel. I suppose he's got them. Obviously. So where is Witzel? I don't know. I can make this baby talk. I have a better idea. This guy's got a wife and a kid. You're crazy. I haven't got any wife. Okay, so she's not your wife. Benny and I trailed her. She works in the ad department of the Evening Star. You wouldn't want anything to happen to her, would you, young man? Listen, I'm on the level. I don't know where this guy Witzel is. I didn't even know his name was Witzel until just now. I, I saw this fellow, the one that hired me, just a little while ago. Hey, he's choking me. I can't talk. Oh, Mr. Daring, you're spoiling the young man's tie. Thank you. You say you saw Mr. Witzel a short time ago? Just before I came up here. But it was in a car. We drove around town while he asked me how come I didn't take these plates to New York. Afterwards, he dropped me off at the corner lunchroom. That's all. I don't know where he lives. And I don't know how to find him. Uh-huh. Let's go back to the hotel, Mrs. Redfern. It's getting late and we all need a good night's sleep. Oh, Herman here, he needs his sleep too. I'm sorry to have to keep you up, Herman. What do you want me to do with him? Well, after 24 hours, frankly, I don't care what you do with him. Young man, you have exactly 24 hours either to find Mr. Witzel or to tell us where we can find him. Should you fail to help us before those 24 hours have elapsed, I'm afraid you'll have to discuss your future with Hardman here. After he's been kept awake for 24 hours, he becomes most irritable. He might even visit that young lady who works on the Evening Star. Good night, Herman. Believe me, I'm telling the truth. My only chance to find Whitson for you is if he shows up here of his own accord. Well, he better show up within 24 hours, chum. I don't like shooting a guy's teeth out, especially with his own gun. Sixteen hours. Me, I often wondered what I'd do if I only had sixteen hours before I got my face shot off. Uh, what I need is a good night's sleep. You're sure keeping me up, chum. You know, I've been thinking. You knock a guy off because he gets out of line. Or he gets in your way. Or he pulls a gun on you. This will be the first time I ever knock a guy off because I need a good night's sleep. Listen. For the last time, I don't know where this guy Witzel hangs out. I only saw him twice in my life. Once in this room and last night in a car. The only reason I met him is because he put an ad in the paper. I've got an idea. It's about time, chum. Going someplace? To the newspaper office. Oh, would you care to come along? If I let you go alone, chum, Mr. Dagoff would never forgive me. Market Street, Evening Star Billet. Right. Be sure they make the next edition. Hello, Steve. Glad to see you. Business is dull. Uh, not for me. Uh, Susan, this is uh, my cousin from Milwaukee. We go everywhere together. Hello. Can I help you? No, but you can sure help me. And I don't know why I didn't think of this before. You want to place another personal? No, I want to trace one. I want you to find the man that put that first personal in the paper. The one addressed to me. The guy that uh, signed himself uh, your friend from overseas, Joe. And you don't want to address a personal to him? Uh, can't you just look through your records? He must have left his full name, address, phone number. Will you look? Oh, that's strictly against the rules. But my little brother would never forgive me if I failed you. 
At last, I found a use for your little brother. Cousin, I don't like to keep reminding you, but time's, time's are wasting. wasting. I know, I know. Oh, here it is. Full name, Joseph Wills. Phone, Grant 34293. Try to be patient, cousin. I was afraid of that. Chinese laundry. There's an address here. Oh, forget about it. Just be another phony. Susan, I've got to find that man. It's a matter of life and death. Can't you remember something about him? Anything? What'd he look like? Well, if he gave a phony name and address. But wait a minute. I do remember something about him. Something that struck me as rather odd. Odd what? Well, odd that a funny little man like that could be in the air call with you. How do you mean? Well, he... he was too old and... And he wore thick glasses. Bookkeeper type? Well, maybe. Except he, he had real dirty fingernails. Do you think he could have been a garage mechanic? Doubt it. But it, it could have been grease under his nails. Or ink. Or ink. Ink. That could be a printer. A printer with a sideline. You know what I mean? I know what you mean. You're coming with us. Here. But I just can't walk out of the office. Uh, get a gal to relieve you. Just tell him that uh, a friend of yours is dying. That's no lie, either. If you don't come along, I will be dying. Ask my cousin. Steve, you're in trouble. Sister, you ain't kidding. <laughs> We should cheer up. Only five more to go. Yeah, then we cross the bay and canvas all the Oakland shops. Let's get something straight. It'll be dark in about an hour. All the shops will be closed. That's when we stop and start again, first thing in the morning. You forget one thing, chum. Your time's up before morning. And my time's up right now, unless I get paid. Now, how much do we owe you so far? Twenty-four thirty-five. Wouldn't it be cheaper to buy our own car? Hey, uh, keep the change. And wait right here. I'll wait here, too. I lost 10 pounds already getting in and out of this hack. Courage, cousin. Can I help you? Yes, uh, something in a business letterhead. Ah, oh, show you some samples. Excuse me for a moment, please. There, yeah, sure you'll find what you want there. I think I already have. This young lady works for the Evening Star in the classified ad department. At the end of last week, a man came into the office with a personal for the paper addressed to uh, ex-captain Steve Mallory. Was signed your friend from overseas, Joe. She says that you're the man that filed that ad with her, are you? Oh, yes. Yes, I placed such a name. I had a feeling I'd seen the young lady somewhere before when you first came in. I'm Steve Mallory. And you're no friend of mine from overseas. I'd like an explanation. The explanation is quite simple. One of my customers was in the shop that day. He asked me to place the ad. What customer? Him. What's his name? How do I find him? I just can't recall the name of him. But I could look it up for you on the records, shall I? I'd appreciate it. It won't take but a minute, if you'll wait. I, uh, think we'll go with you, if you don't mind. But why should I mind? I'm not a bit so. Miller! They've been asking questions, dangerous questions. The girl, she's the one I placed the ad with at the newspaper. Doing a little detective work, Mr. Mallory? Isn't that what you hired me for? Inspector Crean? 
I told you not to trust that guy. If you ask me, he is a Fed on the level. All right, talk. How'd you get here and what'd you come here for? Inspector, you must have a short memory. And there's one Secret Service man to another I'm ashamed of you. Stand still. Wow. Here's something for a man to dream about. His own personal United States Treasury. Kind of fit sure in a neat setup here, huh? Tell me, Inspector. Did they put up much of a fight when you cornered them in this den? Lock up the front. customers by the way they knock? Take a look. If they came alone, we're okay. Talk to Mr. Dagoff. Otto Dagoff. You waiting for that couple who went inside? Yeah. It's gonna be a long time, said not to wait. Keep the change. Gee, thanks. I tell you, it's Al Turk. I can see him right now. If he came out of that print shop, that puts Whistle there. Okay, I'll wait. Driving, he beat it. So they came along. Better take a look out back. Why'd you come here? You gonna answer that? If you give me a chance, then go ahead and answer. Otto Dagoff came to that apartment last night with some others. They wanted the plates. They said that I was tied up with a man named Witzel. I told them I didn't know anybody by that name. They didn't believe me and they gave me 24 hours to find him. Or they'd make trouble for her. He's telling the truth. Then tell me some more. How'd you happen to come here? Checking print shops. What for? Miss Lane thought the man that placed that ad in the personal column, the one addressed to me, was a printer. So you weren't looking for printers, huh? You just said something about ads in personal columns, so answer me this. How come you knew the way to contact Otto Digoff was to put an ad in a New York paper? It was just a stab in the dark. You're a liar. You're a fat. Steve! Come on, talk! You're not gonna get any more out of him. Go get the car. We're getting out of here for good. May I please give him a glass of water? Go ahead, sister. He's all yours now. 
we have to leave the press? You don't have to leave it. You can stay here and hold hands with it till the cops come if you want to. But I, I... Go rip out the phone wires. Thank you, young man. I am deeply grateful. This is quite cozy, Henry. Nice little hideaway. What do you want, Otto? <laughs> do you hear that, Herman? Henry would like to know what I want. You know what I want, Henry. I came here for Dan Redfern's plates. Where are they? I haven't got them. I never had them. I want those plates, Henry. I told you I haven't got them. What plates did you use when you printed these? My own. A man named Langdon made them for me. You're lying, Henry. This is the most perfect job. And I think I know the plates that made it. Either you, Henry, or this man is going to tell me where Dan Redfern's plates are. And the man who... I'm a family man. I, I just work at this little shop. I've done a few odd jobs for Mr. Witzel, but... I don't know a thing about what plates were used on that press. I... Why, you're frightened, aren't you? And I believe you have every reason to be. Because if you don't tell me where Redfern's plates are... He doesn't know any more about it than I do. A family man should be more considerate, or do you carry a very large life insurance policy? Don't, Mr. Dagoff. It's over there. In his coat. You little rat. Take it easy, chump. Listen, Otto, listen. If you want to make a deal, okay. I bought those plates from Dan Redfern. Oh, don't make me laugh, Henry. If you stole these plates from Redfern, it's possible that you even killed him for them. And you hired this young man to pose as Redfern, come to New York with the imitation plates to sell to me as the originals. I dislike people who try to cheat me out of $30,000, Henry. Now, wait a minute, Otto. You got this all wrong, huh? Words fail me. Words cannot express how much I dislike you, Henry. Otto, I... Otto! Not me, Mr. Takeoff. I told you where it was, didn't I? I'd be glad to, Mr. Takeoff. I'm a good printer. I'd be a valuable man to your organization, Mr. Takeoff. A good, reliable man. Reliable, you say? All right, get hold of that satchel and come along with us. Thank you, Mr. Taylor. What do you want to do with these two? We'll leave them to you, Herman. Come along, Benny. Take off. I played square with you. You asked me to find this man Witzel, and I did. Now give us a break. Let me take her out of here. Goodbye, young man. It's a pleasure to have met you and your charming young friend here. Now listen, Herman. Hold it, talk, chum. Herman, use your head. Hold you it. I don't like this any more than you do. This is your own gun, remember? I told you I don't like to do this. Especially with your own gun. <laughs> Come and 
Something's taking a long time. Something must have happened to him. Go and see, Benny. Okay. Stay where you are, Dago. <laughs> Danny. You'd better come out, Dagoff. I'd like a chance. I'll come out. All right, come out. Keep your hands high. I'll tell you everything I know. I guess that's the end of a counterfeiter. Hey, who's that fellow? His name's Henry Witzel. He told me he was Inspector Crean. Oh, so that's the guy. Yeah. And a good friend of mine, too, only he doesn't know it. What do you mean? He saved my life. Can you get this into your next edition? It's another ad for the personal column. You and your ads in the personal column. Haven't they caused you enough trouble? Well, if they answer this one, I'm due for a lifetime of trouble. Here, I'll read it for you. A personable young veteran with steady government job seeks acquaintance of attractive young lady. Object, matrimony. Hey, where are you going? Out to marry you. Before some other attractive young lady beats me to it. 